All right, so today is going to be a continuation of yesterday. Uh, it's going to be the same sort of logic, except what we're going to use instead of a rectangle is going to be what would be a three-dimensional rectangle, if you will, uh, but it's going to fit inside a curve. And so we're going to find different three-dimensional shapes that will fit inside this curve. And then much like we found the area of each rectangle, we're going to find the area of each three-dimensional shape and then use that sum to approximate the volume of a three-dimensional shape. Uh, so today's example is going to be the volume of a sphere. So what if we wanted to estimate the volume of a sphere, which has a radius of four units? Now we're going to make an assumption. We're just going to pretend that we live in the world that we do not know the formula for a sphere, but we do know how to do integral calculus. Logical step, I know. Uh, so how can we go about approximating it? Well, the first thing I would do is I would divide the sphere into uh, equal three-dimensional shapes. So yesterday we did equal two-dimensional shape are all rectangles. In this case, we're going to have a three-dimensional shape. In this case, we'll use cylinders. We can choose any amount. So I will choose eight equal intervals. The logic is if I have four on the positive side, four on the negative, uh, it's a sphere, so it's symmetrical. I'm putting the y-axis right down the middle, x-axis also, so the sphere is going around the origin. And if I can just calculate half the sphere, I can multiply it by two and have the other half. Uh, the image I'll draw will be two-dimensional, forcing us to use our imagination. So here we go. All right, so here's my sphere. When I look at it two-dimensionally, it would just be a circle. Think of the sun or the moon, both spheres uh, relatively. Uh, but when we look at it, we only see a circle. Now, I divided the right side, this is the positive side, into what looks like four rectangles. But that's only because that each of these are kind of like a, a cylinder, they're like a hockey puck. If you were to look at a hockey puck sideways, it arguably looks like a rectangle. It isn't until you tilt it and you actually move it that you see that there is some depth to it. Uh, so the face of each of these cylinders is obviously a circle. And then the height is going to be the interval between the three and the four, between your X values. Now I label as H and R, and I tried color coding it. Uh, so the height of my cylinder is going to be the width of my interval. So from three to four, that has a width of one. So the height of my cylinder is going to be one. Some people get a little confused and they make uh, the height being this because it's the height of a rectangle. The problem with that is that you would have to calculate a more complex height for every single one of these cylinders. Whereas this way, I know the height is going to be one, and I am going to be calculating the radius, uh, which would just be from whatever point touches the curve. I would plug that x value into the equation of a semicircle. Uh, so the entire circle is obviously x squared plus y squared equals r squared. If we solve for y, we've done this a few times, you get that y equals the square root of 16 minus x squared. Everything down here would be the negative. However, I do not care about that because I know that this radius is this that radius, and I only need one radius value in order to calculate the volume of a cylinder. Uh, so to do this first cylinder right here, I am going to plug in the value to where it is touching the curve. In this case, the three touches the curve. So I am going to plug in three in for my x, and I would have 16 minus three squared or 16 minus nine, which is seven. Square root of seven is about 2.65. Well, when I go to plug that in, I realize since I'm squaring my radius, I'm not gonna use the decimal, I'm gonna use the radical because pi times root seven squared times the height of one, squaring the square root goes away, seven times one is seven. So the volume when I plug in three is seven pi. Now, what I'm gonna be doing next is I'm gonna do each of these cylinders. So I'm gonna do it when X equals zero, when X equals one, and when X equals two. When I finish, I will have the area of these four cylinders. Here we are. So the volume when I plugged in zero would be 16 pi. 
then 15 pi one and 12 pi for two. You'll know if you're doing this wrong because if you do not have descending values, then you probably plugged in something wrong. Also, if this seven pi is larger than any of your three volumes, you also did something wrong because the volume should be decreasing as you get smaller cylinders. And so the approximation to the volume would be the sum of those four volumes. And so when I add those four volumes together, I get 50 pi, which is half of a sphere. And so then I'm gonna double that to get the full sphere and I'm getting 100 pi. So I'm claiming that the volume of the sphere is 100 pi or about 314 cubic units. Now going back to reality, I do know the equation for the volume of a sphere. So if I'm just gonna check to see how close I was and my actual volume should be four thirds pi r cubed. I plug in four because the sphere has a radius of four and I get 256 pi divided by three, which is about 268 cubic units. Now we have something called an error percentage. An error percentage will say, take the difference of what you got to what you should have had, take the absolute value of it, because if I had a negative, it doesn't matter, it's still a percent off. I would say that it's a percent higher or a percent lower. I wouldn't say it's a negative 17%. I mean, I guess you could as long as it's in context. Uh, so I'm taking the absolute value of this, dividing it by out of what it should be, and I'm getting 46 over 268 or about 17%. So my estimation was 17% higher than what it should have been. And so I think to myself, how could we reduce this? Well, one way could be from my original picture, I could have done uh, maybe 16 cylinders instead of my eight cylinders or I could have done 32 or 64 or a million cylinders. The more cylinders you have, the less of a chance you would have for all this overlap. Speaking of the overlap, I could have probably also done the middle rectangular approximation method. In this case, I guess it's the middle cylinder approximation method. It's still RAM, but I was just saying. Um, and so if I would have done in the middle, I would have been plugging in three and a half, two and a half, one and a half and a half into this formula. Now, I personally didn't feel like doing those fractions, squaring them, subtracting them from 16 and taking the square root of it. But if you wanted to be more exact, you would have done the MRAM instead of I chose LRAM. Uh, and then you would have had a, a, a smaller percent of error. I think the book chose to do that and their percent of error was one half of a percent. So it was pretty accurate. Uh, the other way I could have done it is I could have done the right, which that would have undercut it. My guess is, is it probably would have undercut it as much as we overcut it. Uh, so then we probably would have had the same amount of error of about 17%. Uh, so your homework tonight is going to be three problems. Uh, they all involve either using three dimensional shapes or uh, the concept of it being under a curve. It's not as nice as the problems were yesterday. Uh, they will just be a little bit more complicated. But anyway, try them out. I'll still look for those submissions. I'm making the video now. It's one o'clock on Monday and we only had two people submit the work. So I know there's some issues with Google. So if you weren't able to get on, don't worry about it. Um, We'll figure that out. Anyway, good luck. I'll be in Zoom. If you need any help whatsoever, please feel free to come in and uh, ask for help. Good luck.